I'm Arjoba, and welcome to the History of Sacadvelo, Georgia. I am your host, Roberto, and this is Episode 2, Before Colchis, from the Mesolithic Era to the Mid-Bronze Age. We're going to talk about prehistoric discoveries dating from the Mesolithic Era to the Mid-Bronze Era, pottery, and some burial ground finds, all leading us up to the founding of ancient Colchis. Now, this for sure isn't my area of expertise, and there's quite a lot of speculation around this era, as we don't really have a written historical record of anything, so let me try my best in getting you caught up to Colchis. I had thought that I could just start off with Colchis, and that it would be completely fine to do so. But part of me, that part which listens to huge amount of history podcasts, saw that everyone goes way back. Now, I regret to say, while there were articles for the Paleolithic period that I read through, I just had a horrible time of understanding all the academic language, and not from lack of trying. I don't want to spend more time looking up words than I do researching, so we'll just go on ahead with the Mesolithic period and get started that way. I promise, Colchis will come soon. Hopefully. Anyways, as I mentioned before, the Mesolithic period. This era ran from 8500 to 7000 BC. Not much is known about the Mesolithic period of Georgia, but the little we do know of western Georgia during this time can be seen through cave sites on the mountain slopes on the coast of the Black Sea, which contain flint microliths and bone tools, as well as animal remains that indicated that these areas used to contain forests. Surprisingly enough, the locations are found at relatively high altitudes as well. It's also worth mentioning that during this time period, the Black Sea was several kilometers away from the present-day coastline that we know of today. This is due to lowered sea levels at the time, and an even more interesting fact is that the Black Sea wasn't a sea at all, but it was a freshwater lake that was fed by an extensive network of European glaciers. I dubbed the the Black Lake. As Frank Sinatra once sang, Weather-wise, it's such a lovely day. And this was especially true because during the early Mesolithic period, the climate improved significantly, allowing for plants to expand and grow up the mountain slopes in South Caucasia. From 8000 to 7000 BC though, thanks to climate instability, the plants started disappearing and the glaciers began reforming. In the east, however, there were more open settlements along the Salka Plateau, which is situated along the mountain steppe landscapes. They differ from their western counterparts by using obsidian in the manufacturing of stone tools. The animal remains were of different species, which may lead us to believe that a forest and steppe environment were present. Weather-wise, summer in the east will have been quite a few degrees warmer than it is right now, but still quite arid. Southern Georgia, on the other hand, had extensive cultural development in the late 8th millennium BC during the post-Mesolithic pre-Neolithic era, foreshadowing the start of a Neolithic industry based almost entirely on obsidian obtained from South Georgian sources. As we depart from the Mesolithic era, we approach the Neolithic era, which ran from 7000 to 4800 BC. Surprisingly enough, Georgia is a place with the best evidence for the emergence and evolution of Neolithic communities. These communities first appeared in the subtropical western zone that bordered the Black Sea. Around 7000 BC, there were a few things that suggest a shift from the Mesolithic lifestyle, including changes in their material culture, economic subsistence, and settlement changes that are way more in tune with the sedentariness of the Neolithic lifestyle. Going along with this Neolithic lifestyle, in the western and northwestern parts of eastern Georgia, we see two societies form. The earliest, called Anaseuli, is a sort of pre-pottery society that lasted for about 800 years. Evidence of it is found along the Colchian Depression and is distinguished by their chipped stone industry that was based on flint and obsidian blade core techniques. Contrasting the Anaseuli tradition, we have the Paluri tradition which was a stone flake industry that was spread across the foothills and mountains. Despite both of their technological and geographical differences, the Anaseuli and Paluri societies moved away from the caves and rock shelters to live in open-air settlements. But sadly, few of these settlements exist nowadays. These early Neolithic people built freestanding wattle and daub houses that looked to be close to a square in shape. 
a picture of Wado and Dalb housing will be shown on the website and social media. Leaving the early Neolithic and traveling into the middle Neolithic period, we see the start of the so-called Odishi culture. This is when Western Georgia begins to assume primacy over its eastern neighbors with the manufacturing of early pottery along the North Colchian coast around 6000 BC. The Odishi culture held a repertoire of handmade ceramics of non-articulated shapes that are mostly burnished red or brown and occasionally incised with the pattern. There is also some evidence of increased agricultural practices through a range of ground and polished tools. Sadly. The acidity of soils has left few traces of macrofossils, and very few settlements of these cultures remain. It's worth noting that the Black Sea, better known as the Black Lake in the Mesolithic period, rose to a more or less the modern sea levels during the Neolithic period as glaciers in the Caucasus and Eastern Europe melted and the Black Sea overflowed into the Mediterranean. Ah, the Black Lake. It was a short-lived period. Moving over to Eastern Georgia, we see evidence of settlements along the Kura and Araxis river valleys. Unlike in West Georgia, these communities established clusters of farmsteads that became intensely settled over long periods of time, accumulating deposits of artifacts which make archaeologists' jobs much easier. These settlement patterns are similar to the Anatolian when compared to the Colchian landscape. What is funny though, is that these Neolithic settlers of eastern Georgia avoided the most fertile riverside valleys of the Yori and Alazani valleys and instead established their villages in areas that allowed for the farming of cereals, albeit with careful management. An ongoing theory is that the Yori and Alazani valleys were densely forested at the time and these settlers had to establish their villages along the steppe border where they could cultivate their grain without clearing the land. Another reason is that the Hrami, Debeda, and Mashavera rivers could also be less prone to glacial meltwater floods than the Alazani and Yuri rivers. To all you wine lovers out there, myself included, domesticated grape pips recovered from late Neolithic sites allows Georgia to claim to be the homeland of winemaking and viticulture. Wine appears to play a central role in the social and economic life of these first farmers. Ah, <sighs> it looks like some things never change in Georgia. Gotta love Georgian wine. It's the best in the world in my opinion. And no, I promise I'm not biased at all. I totally don't have a few bottles stored somewhere. <clears throat> Hide the wine! I guess, now that I mentioned the late Neolithic period, it's time to start there. This period lasted from 5800 to 4600 BC. An agricultural tradition existed during this time called the Shulaveri Gora, located south of Tbilisi in Kvemokartli and much of eastern Transcaucasia including northeastern Armenia and northwestern Azerbaijan. These sites have shown a high density of architecture, composed of compounds that are cell-like in plan, which distinguishes them from agricultural settlements. These sites had places to store and process food, among other activities. The dwellings were built from mud bricks and had dome roofs. Their pottery was coarse, monochrome, and handmade, and usually limited to egg shapes. The stone tool and bone industry are notable for their quantity, diversity, and quality. The stone tools were predominantly obsidian crafted into well-made conical cores which produced a repertoire of blades, burins, and scrapers. Occasionally, the period between the Neolithic and Bronze Ages tends to be called the Chalcolithic period. Information about the Chalcolithic period, which went from 4800 to 3100 BC, can be split into three different areas. The East and West Transcaucasus and the North Caucasus. Chronologically, the East Transcaucasian is divided into two periods. The Early Chalcolithic Period from 4800 to 4000 BC and the Middle Late Chalcolithic Period from 4000 to around 3200 to 3100 BC or even to 3000 BC. This latter phase, whose cultural spears stretched well into East Anatolia, is relevant to the origin of the Kura Araxes culture. These Chalcolithic sites cover a much greater area with more diverse ecological zones compared to the ones found in the Neolithic sites. As communities began to move upland, they started utilizing the thin soils of foothills and mountains that allowed them to graze animals much more easily well into the Kura Araxes period, including sheep, cattle, and possibly pigs. There is even some evidence that these became primary husbanded animals during this time. There is an argument that pig bones constitute evidence against a nomadic lifestyle, 
but not against a transhuman subsistence strategy. There are also numerous analyses that show that this region experienced increased temperatures and moisture, which rendered the lowland floodplains uninhabitable during spring snowmelt, and forced a diversification in resource exploitation apart from cereal-based agriculture. High summer temperatures lead us to believe that droughts were possibly more likely to occur and increase the risk of crop failure. Now we enter the early and middle Bronze Ages, which go from 3000 to 1500 BC. At the beginning of this era, by 3000 BC, the village communities of stock breeders and farmers that emerged during the late Chocolatic period were fully established in the highlands of Transcaucasus and Eastern Anatolia. These communities formed what can best be described as tribal societies or simple chiefdoms. So, what distinguishes the Bronze Age Georgians from the Mesolithic, Neolithic, and Chocolithic Georgians? Well, something called the Kura Araxes Package, which is marked by the ways ancient Georgians adapted to different regions. In Georgia, this includes architectural diversity, where they had freestanding rectangular dwellings with wattle and daub walls supported on a framework of posts. This was the preferred methods in the regions of Shirakartli and parts of the Javakheti region. In the Near East, they used mud brick and circular architecture, which emphasized a strong sense of regional diversity. The Kura Araxes package also standardized the domestic use of space, as they had a terracotta hearth built into the floor, a bench along the back wall, and a portable horseshoe-shaped horned hearths. During this period, they also had highly distinctive ceramics. Despite all the regional variations, the Kura Araxes crafts reflect a sort of sameness, as they were all ornamented with relief, fluted, and incised designs. They were burnished and fired to a red or black color. Occasionally, they were polished with a lustrous finish. It is theorized they were meant to imitate metal containers. Metal technology also developed during this period, as the rich copper-bearing deposits in the mountains that surround Georgia provided the fundamental ingredient for Bronze Age metallurgy. Hey, didn't I mention in episode 1 that the geography helped the Georgians survive? Guess these mountains were more than useful. The Kura Araxes metalsmith started by favoring the use of copper arsenic alloys, but by the end of the 3rd millennium BC, they preferred using tin to produce a limited repertoire of bronzes, which normally turned into ornaments, dress pins, lunate earrings, spearheads, and shaft hole axes. These were meant to deal more with display and prestige than utilitarian tasks possibly to mark the people of note in the rising simple chiefdoms that were beginning to come about. Around 2300 BC, or even a bit earlier, towards the end of the early Bronze Age, communities began to change. In Georgia, they began burying people of note in a different way than the simple pit burials of preceding millennium. They began constructing large and striking barrow tombs, also known as kurgans, which are the hallmarks of this new age of fundamental social changes. The rich assemblage of these burials included vessels of precious metals, and in some cases a vehicle or part of a vehicle with four wheels of solid wood. As mentioned previously, this goes hand in hand with the rise of bronze being used in ornamentation. I guess those in power will always want to show themselves as a cut above the rest. The early Kurgans are found at Marcopi, Trialeti, Sangori, Bedeni, and the Alazani Valley. These kurgans are mounds of earth and stone going up to 15 meters covering the internment site, making them conspicuous features of the landscape. Pictures will be provided. The dead were cremated or had their bones ceremonially placed on a wooden platform. In most cases, the deceased had symbols of powers buried along with them, once again denoting their status. The Bronze Age also saw the emergence of woodworking. The use of timber and joinery in a kurgan and wheeled vehicles shows a level of sophistication unprecedented in earlier archaeological periods. We don't know the reasons behind this yet, but the development of sturdy bronze axes would have allowed for trees to be maintained without the need of large fire burning to clear the land. In 2014, during a pipeline construction, a gravesite was found with more than 100 burial chambers encircled by basalt at the Safar Karaba necropolis in the historic region of Trialeti, now known as the Salka district of southern Georgia. Analysis suggests that the site was used in the 15th to mid-14th centuries BC. All these graves were rectangular and uniform with only a few exceptions, 
and contained skeletons placed in crouched positions oriented north to south, which is a pattern that indicates well-established funeral practices. Several artifacts were also found, including a cylindrical seal that showed a figure kneeling at an altar with a rod in its hand, which is a common motif of Mitanni or Hurrian art that was widespread in the Levant and Mesopotamia, bronze daggers, and surgical scalpels of a type not commonly found anywhere else in the Caucasus region. We'll talk about the Mitanni or Hurrians in the next episode. The grave that the pipeline uncovered, however, contained a poorly preserved wooden cart with the remains of an axle, wheel, and yoke. Two clay vessels were also positioned on the remains of the cart's bed. Human remains were found under the vessels. Unfortunately, archaeologists were unable to discover this grave until after the pipeline construction disturbed many of the objects, making it difficult to reconstruct this burial. The skeleton was of a man around 40 to 50 years of age, which had fabric attached to him that provides clues to the types of fabrics produced during this time period. Samples contained linen, cotton, and wool dyed with pigments that could have been only extracted from mollusks along the Mediterranean coast. Since raw dye was highly perishable, these textiles must have been produced and dyed near the Mediterranean before they were imported into the Caucasus, which suggests connections between the South Caucasus and surrounding regions, perhaps the presence of early trade networks. Now, that's all folks. Next time, we're going to finish our lead up to the start of Colchis and start name dropping several historical figures as well. I can't wait to get these episodes out to you. So remember, I'm trying to remain on a bi-weekly schedule and dropping around Friday night or Saturday morning as I finish recording and editing. I really hope you enjoyed this one because trust me, it was a hard one to research and write about between all the what ifs and theories. So let me end with these few words. The best way to get this podcast built up is to tell your friends about it. I would highly appreciate your support and feedback for this project. So let me know what I can do well or what I could do better. Constructive criticism is appreciated as it lets us be more interactive. If you have anything you want to say, feel free to look us up on Facebook and Instagram as The History of Sacramento, Georgia, on Twitter at History underscore Georgia, or on our website at historyofsacadvelo.com, or our email at thehistoryofsacadvelo.georgia at gmail.com. Sacadvelo is spelled S-A-Q-A-R-T-V-E-L-O. Madloba da Nakbamdis, and thank you for listening to the History of Sacadvelo, Georgia. See you next time. <laughs> Ne vadim